And one of the things that I really convey in the book is that, you know, emotions like anxiety, fear, sadness, where they're called negative emotions as if they should be and could be erased from the human experience. They are part of the human experience. They're basic human emotions and they're signals from our body. They're signals from our brain. We can choose what to do with them, what to do with that information, but we can't erase it. At least our neurosurgery isn't good enough to like go into the brain and carve out. And, and, and it, gives, it gives texture to life. At the same time, it can be overwhelming, right? It can turn into an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder like major depression. But the emotion in and of itself is not a bad thing, is not dangerous. There's no good or bad emotions. Why do we chronically label emotions as good or bad? especially when they are at the heart of being human. They're just emotions. And the weird thing is this, when something bad happens and we feel anxious or sad, we easily forget the fact that we will probably come out of this just fine. We forget for a while that we're going to make it through whatever bad is happening at that moment, probably without any long lasting kind of elements at all, Tim. Yeah. Now, there is an evolutionary benefit to being focused on the present moment, you know, when things aren't going well. Those emotions of sadness and anxiety are good triggers to get our attention, to let us know that we need to deal with something right now in the present moment. They remind us that we need to focus on solving for now in order to stay alive long enough to get to the point in time when we're not in danger. So given this evolutionary lens, it kind of makes sense. I guess the trouble I'm having is this, the fact that we we tend to forget that we have this ability to be resilient and that forgetting of that doesn't really serve us well in today's day and age, especially now that we're not hunter gatherers anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's odd because like we as a species, we've forgotten a lot of things. No, that's we, for sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have collectively forgotten about things, including like natural disasters and wars and famines and plagues and even the Ice Age, you know, all because those events aren't imminent to our daily lives. I mean, man, talk about availability bias. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we definitely have availability and recency biases with this, right? But right now, in this episode, we are not so much focused on those biases as we are on resilience. That's the heart of this episode of Behavioral Grooves. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. When we first met up with our guest in this episode, Jonathan DePiro, he and his co-authors had just finished a book about resilience. Now, Jonathan was the voice we heard at the beginning of this episode, by the way. And we had a terrific conversation, and he introduced us to some clever ways of thinking about our lives. Jonathan knows a lot about resilience as he was the first person in his immediate family to finish college and ultimately earn his PhD in clinical psychology. He's also got a lot of personal experience with resilience. He experienced extensive bullying in his childhood, so much so that it led to periods of depression. The story of resilience in his life is a pretty good story, and so is the book. But our conversation went well beyond Jonathan's personal story. We talked about the roles of optimism and social support in being resilient. We also spent a fair amount of time talking about gratitude. This was really cool because we talked about gratitude on a personal level, but also spent some time on how gratitude affects productivity and well-being at work. Yeah, gratitude turns out to be a remarkably important foundation for being a successful leader. Right, Tim. And we see this over and over in the work that we do with clients around the world. The leaders who really embrace gratitude have incredibly productive teams. So we hope you check out this conversation with Jonathan for more than just some fluffy feel good on seeing your way through tough times. It's... It's a lot more than that. Yeah, agreed, Kurt. And, and so with that, we want to encourage all of the Groovers to sit back with a resilience cocktail and enjoy our conversation with Jonathan DePiro. Dr. Jonathan DePiro, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. 
Thank you for having me. It is our pleasure to have you. And we need to know instantly, right away, super speed round question, Barbie or Oppenheimer? Mm, Barbie. Barbie. Okay. Good. That was, I, I like, I like the certitude and speed with which you answered. Nice, <laughs> nice job. <laughs> uh, all right, Jonathan, next speed round question. Are you a coffee drinker or a tea drinker? Coffee. Too much coffee. Too much. There is no <laughs> such thing. I think that is a, there is, there is no such thing as too much coffee. I wish, I wish that the, our listeners could have seen your face. You had like the very expressive too much coffee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, which is more successful way of connecting with your resilience? Is it confronting your fears or basically just ignoring them? Confronting your fears. Okay. And that, that this is a speed round. We'll get into this at, and as we go forward. But uh, last speed round question that we have for you here. True or false? Being resilient is basically just having great willpower. False. Okay. Uh, 100% false. 100% false. Well, let's, let's dig. Uh, actually, before we go there, before we go there, let's, let's start with um, understanding why our listeners should be interested in this, the third edition of the the book resilience here as that we're going to be talking about um and and why now what 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 happened that you guys decided to you and your co-authors decided hey we need a third edition of this book yeah so i'll say a few things one is that we uh, have a lot of collective expertise among our team and our colleagues in looking at resilience looking at you know what people, what strategies people use to get through difficult times, to grow and adapt following life's challenges. So the book weaves that in to really wonderful conversations that we've had with people who have actually been in the trenches and have dealt with difficult things. And the third thing that is really helpful in this edition is that there are a lot of exercises, activities, things that you can do, take home points that are based in extensive research. Not ones we just came up with off the top of our head. Um, <laughs> not a Google one, search and not that's a Google it. search. It wasn't chat <laughs> GTP. Um, it was something that these are the these are tools that we know and we've heard people use and that have clinical psychological research behind it. Let me ask you this from this perspective, do you feel like you needed to write this book to to fill in some gap in our world? Like is is there Go ahead. Maybe just just answer it from that perspective. Yeah. One of the events, of course, that led to us updating the book was the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is different than other traumas that we've experienced in the world for quite some time because it affected pretty much everybody on the planet and affected people in different ways. Some people lost relatives or friends or family. Others had to shelter in place and were kind of socially isolated for a long time. There was a lot of uncertainty. And also, we saw for our healthcare workers, New York City was the epicenter of the epicenter. I was there at Mount Sinai those first few months. And our healthcare workers were dealing with a lot of death with mm. patients, a lot of difficult conversations with family members who couldn't physically be in the room. Uh, they were feeling a threat to their own life of being on these units. You know, we had a, a tent in Central Park you know, where we were taking care of patients across from the hospital. And we learned a lot about uh, resilience, about stress, and about trauma through talking to and researching the impact on our own healthcare workers. So we have actually quite a body of literature, over 20 publications, understanding uh, resilience in our own healthcare workers. Yeah. Okay. So great outline of you know moving from a more academic book to a more one that is accessible with all of, and, and I have to say, the at the end of each chapter, there's some fantastic kind of just things to to learn. But we talked about in the speed round that all right, resilient isn't just having great willpower. So, what is resilience? Can you define it for our listeners? Yeah, so there are a lot of different ways to uh, define resilience, and here's how we planted the flag in the ground with our definition. Our definition is the ability to adapt, recover, and grow from life's challenges, big and small. Which which I love. And and there's also a part that you talk about, about things to keep in mind uh, as you're reading the book. And I thought they were really insightful. And so I, I'll, I'll go over them. I'm not going to ask you to, to just to repeat them from memory. But it, it, one was resilient people have faced challenges. And so this idea that they've faced something, you can't be resilient if you have a 
perfect, absolutely lovely life and you know, never have challenges. Um, resilience unfolds under time. Feeling distressed does not mean someone is not resilient. Resilient often involves growth. Resilient can differ across the lifespan and resilience occurs in context. And so I just want to dig in on, on a couple of those because I thought they were really interesting. So I love this idea that feeling distressed does not mean someone is not resilient. Can you expand on that for us just a little bit? Right. You know, traumas and major life stressors are exceptionally common. And in the days and weeks following those events, say a loss of a job or loss of a loved one um, or something like the COVID-19 pandemic, it's natural and understandable and reasonable to feel anxious, stressed, fearful, sad, a little withdrawn. Those are natural human bodily reactions. And that doesn't mean you're not resilient. And yeah. I also want to say on the other end of the spectrum, um, I used to work with 9-11 first responders, mm -hmm. many of whom developed PTSD and depression and anxiety, uh, understandably so, from the extreme human suffering that they saw at Ground Zero and in the months afterwards. And I learned a whole lot about what it means to be resilient from uh, folks who are struggling or were struggling on a day-to-day -day basis with the emotional impact of the event. Um, and so even in conditions like PTSD, anxiety, significant medical illness, and I'll talk about our colleague, Dr. Southwick, in a little bit, we see strands of resilience. And one more point is that Many of our healthcare workers and many people who have been through life-threatening events, like veterans, combat veterans, say that they've changed in at least one positive way as a result of the event. Um, and what we know is that the emotional struggle that people go through actually makes that growth makes that growth more likely. So growth and distress go together. It was actually our healthcare workers who had PTSD symptoms who told us they had the most post-traumatic growth which is really fascinating, right? Like the idea that this happens in the context of distress as you're examining your life and the impact of the event on your life, as you're working through some stuff that is painful. Yeah, so this isn't sort of like stopping the world and getting off and fixing everything and then getting back on. No. This is like a, a real time, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're building the tracks as you're running the train, basically. Yeah, and, and, and some of the examples that are in the book are, understandably extreme examples, but uh, start start with interviews that were done a couple of decades ago by Dr. Southwick and Charney, or, or my co-authors, with Vietnam War POWs. So yeah. think people like Admiral Stockdale, uh, John McCain, who were in solitary confinement, were tortured for six years. Every day was a nightmare. And at the same time, they found ways to connect to each other. They found meaning and purpose. Some connected to their faith, others connected to humor. They developed a secret language that they can communicate through tapping. So even in horrible situations and in the aftermath of horrible situations, there are strands of connectedness and strands of that, that human spirit that we see. Yeah. And in some of the, the readings I've done on post-traumatic growth is that people who have gone through these even horrific components will often say, I, I wouldn't replace that. I, I would not um, forego that traumatic experience because of the growth that I have come out afterwards. Have you found some of that as well? And, I, and there are some, obviously, that mm -hmm. obviously, yeah, I don't want to ever, yeah, <laughs> if I could not do that, that would be fantastic. I don't want to have to you know, have gone through that experience. But for others, that isn't. Is that is that a common thing? Is that more? I mean, what what is your research shown from that perspective? Yeah, certainly that is something that we've heard. That is not 100%, as you said, not 100% what people say. Like, of course, some, these events have been tremendously life-altering. Uh, there are a couple of examples that stand out to me. We interviewed a physician who was finishing her training at Mount Sinai, uh, Dr. Aline Gregosian. And early on in her residency, before she came to Sinai, she had to have an emergency heart transplant. And she was in her early 30s, a physician in training, Needing, wow. a, a needing a new heart. And she became a critical care physician working in the ICU. And she told us in the, you know, when we spoke to her that this has actually made her a better doctor. Yeah. Being on the other side wow. of the equation in terms of being the patient and not the doctor and being in a critical care setting after surgery, after, you know, in the ICU and helpless in, in many regards, um, made her a better physician. 
That is that is fantastic. I wanted to bounce back to the definition of of resilience, uh, and specifically, and and you you brought up your 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 late colleague, uh, Dr. Stephen Southwick. Later in his life, he wrote that resilience has been defined as the ability to bounce back. But I can't bounce back because he was dying of cancer, and and does it mean? He, and he asked the question: Does it mean that I'm not resilient? So. How do we process that? How do we process this idea that there are some things that we may not be able to bounce back from? Right. I, I think that that's the limitation to defining resilience as as bouncing back, because some of these experiences do leave their marks on us. And some of these experiences are things that we're going to be carrying with us for the rest of our life. People with an advanced cancer diagnosis, people with challenges like diabetes or heart failure or kidney problems, you know, these things may not go away and you can still have a life while facing these challenges. There are people, you know, and, and understandably so, who, who uh, get diagnosed with a medical condition and feel or think that their life is over and withdraw and go under the covers and don't want to talk to their family or friends because they don't want to be asked about how you're feeling. Uh, and there are others who carry on with what they're doing and even embrace life even more so. So just as a quick example, uh, our colleague Steve embraced a meaning and purpose. So he got a lot of meaning and purpose, even in his retirement in publishing and using his insights into trauma to help healthcare workers who were struggling with the pandemic. He uh, told his entire healthcare team that he loved them. He started really embracing altruism and love and social connection. And that helped him tremendously. And also people around him were like vicariously absorbing some of his his resilience and practicing uh, what he preached for so many yeah. years. It, it's interesting because we, again, that, that definition about bouncing back, but there's this part of it. It's about how you're facing the, yeah. the, the trauma, right? Which is, I think, another way of potentially thinking about resilience. And it is, as you said, you can hunker under the covers or uh, as your colleague Steve did, it's finding that purpose and meaning and embracing and going on with life and maybe even going on with life in a different perspective. Uh, is that what you see too from this? Is that part of what you're, 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 you're seeing? Yes. And I also want to make clear as I'm saying this, I don't simply mean, and listeners shouldn't come away from this by saying, oh, he's just saying move on. Yeah. No, what I'm yeah, saying is good. that these illnesses, these things that people are experiencing that are life altering, that they do carry with them are one part of their identity and one part of their life and do not need to be their entire life. So like, as an example, you know, we, we spoken to a lot of, you know, rehab, you know, physical rehabilitation doctors who have patients who um, can't move their limbs and they use their eyes or use their tongue to, to write or to compose music, right? They have not like they've altered the way they engage with their, their values and meaning and purpose, but they've not stopped entirely. They, they even like know that that curiosity is actually important for their recovery or, you know, improvement in functioning or day-to-day -day mood. Yeah. You know, Dan Gilbert has, has researched uh, the subject of, of uh, subjective well-being extensively and how we misattribute this idea that, oh, that person's in a wheelchair, they they must have a terrible life. Right. Uh, when, of course, uh, they I have a brother in a wheelchair and he has a fantastic life. Uh, that's not it's not perfect, uh, but no one's life is perfect. He's he's kind of just got his own thing uh, going. I wanted to address this idea that a key component of resilience is optimism. Yeah. And do you think that optimism is hard to come by? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important first off to clarify that when we write about optimism, we are explicitly not talking about a Pollyannish view mm. of life. We're not saying, you know, don't worry, be happy, so to speak. Um, we're not no saying, Bobby Fair in there. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're not saying, you know, the toxic positivity that, you know, that that's out there. Um, what we're saying is having a realistic appraisal of the challenges that you face and trying as much as you can to focus on what's within your control. People who are optimistic have a realistic sense of their ability to affect change. Uh, yeah. um, and they take steps to make their life better. They take steps to balance the negative with the positive. Right? Someone who's pessimistic feels consistently bogged down by life. 
They feel bogged down by many things that are outside their control and it demotivates them. It drains them of energy and they don't see, their their brain does not see things that might be going well and they don't take steps to make their day-to-day life any better. Mm. So in this work, and you've obviously talked with a lot of people who have gone through very traumatic incidences, but you said you can apply some of those lessons and learnings to just everyday stresses and and components that we have. What are some of the things that our listeners can take away? They're dealing, maybe they're not dealing with, a, you you know, uh, I can't, I no longer can use my arms, but they're dealing with the everyday stresses that we have. And I know we can't get into all of the things that you can do, but what are some of the things that you would, you know, inform our listeners to say, Hey, if you're feeling this and you want to be more resilient, here are some things that you might be able to to control and to do. Yeah, so one big one that pops out and we write two chapters about this is having social support. Yes. And having a role model. So I want to just delve into social support a little bit because there's lots of different flavors of this. Research shows that having somebody, at least one person in your corner, before, during, and after a stressful event is tremendously helpful for your mental health. Having at least one person, it could be a a work friend, and it might be a work friend and somebody at home you talk to about home stuff. It could be a faith leader or somebody in your faith community. Um, But having just even one person is tremendously helpful. So devoting time to your social network. And I was just telling colleagues about this the other day. I um, have a whole bunch of work colleagues in my phone and occasionally throughout the week, I'll just check in to say, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> and that goes a long way. Yeah. They yeah. like it. I like it. And it maintains a connection. And I know that I can go to them. Then we have a, we have a channel, you know, I can go to them. If something happens, they can come to me if something happens and they need me, but that takes all of three seconds. So yeah. like go through your phone, someone you haven't talked to in a while and say, Hey, what's up? How are you doing? does not take very long at all. Right. Um, and it's incredibly valuable because that puts, you know, you don't, you don't want like a, a soccer net with holes in it when you're going through something <laughs> challenging. That puts like, make, make sure those connections, that net is there when you need it. Um, so that's emotional support. What is also helpful, um, and there are many ways to, to go about this, but it's having some tangible support. Somebody that can take care of you if you're sick, like literally take care of you, take you to a doctor's appointment, loan you a few dollars if you need it. That's tangible support. Uh, And the flip side, which, you know, Steve Southwick was just a a master at, is giving support to other people. There is an increasing body of research that shows being a role model, as I said, but giving of your time, giving of your emotional energy comes back on you in a positive way. It's rewarding. You get positive feedback from the people that you're serving, and you would hope, um, and that it feels good to you. So giving and getting social support, including being a role model and also finding role models in your life. And it could be a spiritual figure, historical spiritual figure. It could be a leader that you know. It could be a celebrity. Anybody, find a role model because there's somebody on the planet who's been through something like something like what you've been through before. Chances are, Good yeah. odds are. Yeah. Uh, and there's a good example of how they've managed it. And they don't need to have had like access to all of the resources in the world to have good examples of this. Can you dig in a little bit, Jonathan? So fantastic to have that social support and particularly that one person is, and, and role models as well. But I know you guys have done a lot of the research on brain and why this is. What What's mm-hmm. some of the underlying uh, methods that that is building the resilience that we have. Let's dig in a little bit on, so, all right, that's great to do, but what's the, what is happening to to build that resilience within that? Right. And I'll I'll give you an example from, from many years ago, a researcher in the early 2000s did a study where they had um, women who were married come into the laboratory and get, go into the brain scanner. And while they're in the brain scanner, they were getting painful stimulation on their foot. So like annoying, painful sensations on their foot uh, or on their body when they're in the brain scanner. And there were three conditions. They could do this while holding the hand of their husband. And it was women and and men uh, in this study. Um, And hold the hand of a stranger 
or hold nobody's hand and just be alone in the room. And what they found is the brain response to pain was significantly lessened when they held the hand of their husband, uh, particularly so if they had a good marital relationship, actually. Like, <laughs> the, the marital satisfaction was related to how like blunted the pain response was, but there was still an effect for holding the hand of a stranger. Oh, wow. Um, it was it was less so, but it was still there. And, you know, obviously nothing nothing changed if they were just in the room by themselves. But their social support, like holding a hand, someone being there actually changes how we process experiences. It changes the body's response to emotional distress, mm -hmm. to physical pain. Um, this was Jim Cohen's work. This researcher, Jim Cohen, who is um, really a leader in social neuroscience, like what happens in the brain in, you know, when we have relationships. Uh, very important. And what we know is that feeling lonely um, increases the inflammatory markers in the body. It raises your blood pressure. It raises your heart rate. Uh, people who are lonely tend to live less. They're more likely to have heart attacks. And when they're older, they have like um, less functional status as they get older. Um, so there are real markers in the brain. And I also think, you know, thinking about the brain and thinking about psychology, say you go through something and you have one interpretation of the event. Say you go through, I don't know, the, the, the one example is, say you've been walking down the street in New York City and you were assaulted or mugged at night. You might walk away from that thinking, hey, I shouldn't have been on that street. It's my fault. I should have taken a well, a, a more well-lit block or I should have taken an Uber or, you know, or a taxi. Uh, so that interpretation lives in your head yeah. and can fester in your head. And if you're kicking yourself, kicking yourself, kicking yourself, that can feed into anxiety, depression, PTSD. If you have somebody else in your life, they can say, oh, wait a second. Did you do the mugging? Like, it wasn't your fault. <laughs> right. 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 And so like, right. When you have social support, you can actually get corrective feedback. If you have an odd idea about why something happened or whose fault it was, or uh, your interpretation lives in your head, if you share it with somebody else, they, you have the opportunity for them to tell you, no, that's, that's wild. <laughs> and then the, that, they, they put a little bit new information in your mind and you feel better. Yeah, yeah. I just... That uh, I didn't cause the mugging myself. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that that's, uh, I'm just going to, that's one of my takeaways from our conversation. I'm just going to tell you that. One of the things that I really loved about the book is how uh, being a New Yorker, you are, you, you talked about the Mount, Mount Sinai experience, but 9-11 mm -hmm. was literally in your back door. And uh, so you have these great stories of Jimmy Dunn and Bill Keegan kind of woven throughout the book. And I love that, Bill Keegan reflected perfectly. I think he said something that was just amazing. He said that um, life isn't about forgetting what hurt you. It's learning to live with it. Yeah. I thought that was like this fantastic life lesson. But I'm wondering what you take away from the bigger picture of resilience when it comes to 9-11. Yeah. So Mount Sinai, I should say, has a 22-year history now taking care of 9-11 responders, um, some of our faculty actually responded day one and began to provide medical and mental health care, literally down there at the armory, you know, wow. to affected individuals, people who had lost loved ones, people who had been in the buildings. Uh, and that's carried through. And we, now we actually have, we're one of the hospitals, uh, health systems in the area that have federal funding from this Adroga bill to take care of the medical and mental health needs of uh, responders. And I was really lucky to work in those programs for five years. So I got a lot of experience you know, taking care of them. Did you, uh, did you and, meet these guys? Did you, did you come into contact with like Bill and Jimmy? And, oh, and so I, I actually met Bill, um, yeah, as part of this book. Uh, I've not met Jimmy Dunn uh, personally. He was interviewed for an earlier edition. Mm -hmm. I actually do have a personal connection to him. He went to Notre Dame um, and my brother went to Notre Dame. Oh. Um, and... <laughs> I, I think uh, some of Jimmy Dunn's philanthropy helped my brother get a scholarship. Oh, <laughs> it was wow. like many years ago. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. um, which was, you know, it's been, was really impactful to his life. Um, that's very I don't cool. think Jimmy knows that. Um, but that is, that, that's a sort of a, a strange connection that happened well before I picked up this book. I actually just learned about this a couple of weeks ago. Oh, oh my gosh. 
That's that's really cool. Okay, okay. So that that that's a weird diversion mm -hmm. uh, and a cool one. But uh, like, what what's your big takeaway from seeing all these people um, affected by nine eleven? Where do you see resilience? You know, is is it is it universal? Does everybody you know uh, kind of figure their way through that they make their own path through the troubles and and emerge triumphant? Yeah, I would say the buds of it are universal, like the, the building blocks are universal, right? Social support is something that is just part of the human experience. That's who we are as people. We, you know, we want, have this urge to reach out, make social networks. There are some people that are born more optimistic than others and other people that can, can learn optimism. There are people like my colleague, Dr. Charney, who uh, have physical exercise as a huge part of their identity. And I'm trying to grow that part of my identity. <laughs> you uh, my and arms me are actually, both, like, right really there, sore Jonathan. this morning from like we lifting weights a couple of days ago. Oh, but the, there are threads of this. And I should say, it's not like we really don't want people to read the book saying, this is all on your shoulders. Mm. It's just mm. you. No, like there's that the Thomas Merton book, I think, No Man is an Island. And then really that we, that's what we want to communicate, mm -hmm. right? These things and these resilience factors that we talk about happen in context and need to happen and are encouraged, like the, the communities that thrive best after a trauma on a large scale are ones that come together and support each other. Neighbor helping neighbor, uh, faith communities supporting each other. And we saw that really in New York and, um, and it's, we work a lot with faith communities, but these things happen at scale. They happen at uh, hospital level, you know, in our health system, you know, with units working together like ICUs, teams, they happen in companies, um, they happen in communities and they happen really at a global scale. And so when we think about resilience, especially in the, in the teaching and training we've been doing lately, we really think about how small and big communities can use these skills together. So we never really think about resilience in an individual. We're not teaching an individual resilience and expecting them to live in a bubble uh, and just do it all themselves. We're really thinking about how they can use skills to improve their relationships and how teams can use these skills to improve uh, the support they provide to each other. And, you know, in the hospital, you know, how can they improve patient outcomes? How can they improve patient safety? And how can they um, address some of the challenge, use these skills to address some of the challenges that they face on a daily basis? Yeah. I, I love that aspect that it isn't an individual in a bubble. And a mm -hmm. lot of our listeners work for companies and organizations where they're on a team, they're part of an organization. And so what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I have misunderstood this, is that that organizations can do a lot through building up a resilient culture, uh, yeah. a, a team that understands these factors that are going in. Some of the things that you've already that social aspect, the, the, the mentor piece, you even talked about exercise and different mm -hmm. things that your, your co-author, you know, is doing. And, but it's, it's this within context. And I think that was part of that first part. It, is that something that, uh, if I was a leader within an organization from your perspective, is that something that I should be really focusing in on is how do we build this culture and what can I do? If I'm a leader, what should I be thinking about from that perspective? Right. And actually, I, I was just having a conversation with a leader at Mount Sinai about this this morning. You know, we're really baking this into how we train leaders mm -hmm. in the health system. And I should say a few things. And I, I think it's evolving, but it's, you know, certainly a like mandatory resilience module that people have to do on video wow. at the end of a year, wow. to, you know, checking a box. That's not sufficient. <laughs> that's a individual, people are probably clicking through and not really learning and mm -hmm. are probably irritated that they have to learn about resilience uh, as an individual. Adding stress um, to their life right. and that, that and, <laughs> you know, and, and, pro and, and programs like meditation and yoga are helpful. Yeah. Accessing those programs, meditation, yoga, other like health things are helpful, but not sufficient. And we're really thinking about resilient, you know, a resilient leader is transparent emotionally present, physically present, creates a space that's psychologically safe. By that, I mean uh, an environment where the employees can feel free to be their full selves, can feel free to productively disagree. And like, how often does it, people feel safe or not safe to do that? Um, because if you're going to work feeling afraid, you're not, that that team is not functioning at its best. 
if you're afraid to speak up and you know raise a safety concern or think about a new way of solving a problem, that that team is less creative, um, and they might ha- might have more turnover if if it's not feeling psychologically safe. So we really think about how we can implement these things in the team setting, and we we empower. We actually have um, some federal funding to empower leaders within our health system with tools uh, that will trickle down and impact their teams uh, in a real clear way. So one of them, just just as an example, is gratitude. Mm-hmm. How often do you know, our, t- our team members do something well and we don't shout it out. It's just like, we gloss over it. Okay, like fine, like business as usual, that, that, that outcome, that should have happened. So we're not gonna like, we're not gonna acknowledge it or call it out, but it takes 30 seconds, a minute, two, to say, hey, so-and-so, I really appreciated when you did this and how you handled the situation, calling them out in a team meeting, shouting them out through some com- other kind of recognition, an email, a text message, a conversation, that increases people's engagement if they have those, if they get that recognition. And it's not about like praising them for showing up per se, but it's about, you know, appropriate praise and recognition. You know, when we looked at surveys, our colleagues who do this research have looked at what doctors in the health system have wanted over the years most from their leaders. And one of the top things is gratitude. Uh, of course, uh, again, it's it's the basic human condition, right? Mm-hmm. It, it it's ought not be a big surprise to us, and it ought not be a big surprise to leaders that that is uh, central to uh, to actually uh, making a, a cohesive and functioning and productive team. Uh, and yet, it's lost on us um, all too often, regrettably. Um, near the end of chapter two, John, you you were uh, in the beautiful sort of prescriptive stuff. Here's the things that you can do. You talked about playing upbeat music to stay with positive feelings. And I just, which I was just so super excited about, about reading. Do you play upbeat music to stay with positive feelings? I should do that more. I do do it sometimes. Um, I have a upbeat playlist on my phone. Uh, so when positive things happen to me, uh, and my, my wife has been helping me do this, I actually got an award lately and she got me this like dongle for my keychain. It's like a little piece of plastic. It has a QR code on it. And oh. if you scan the QR code, it plays an upbeat song. Oh. It's like <laughs> when I, I got this like recognition at work and she wanted to like oh. mark the occasion and help me savor it by like giving me this thing I can always carry around with me that plays that plays an upbeat song. I love that. That I is too. I think we should all have a little upbeat, <laughs> you know, dongle. Yeah, it was, that it's we a great reminder. Around. Yeah. I, and I can share that. It's like a, a beautiful song and it's kind of fun. Uh, she got the song is A Star is Born, you know, from the, like the, the movie Hercules, like in like the 90s. Like, oh, yeah. The movie. Yeah. <laughs> the cartoon <laughs> version? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> with, with like Danny DeVito? Yes. The, that one. It's, okay. it's a song from that, okay. that movie. Oh. All right. Go figure. Uh, I, well, that's fantastic. I think. Wait. So just to be clear, this QR code only plays that one song. Yeah, it only plays that one song. Oh, OK. All right. So I, I, um, but I, I have I, a playlist on my, my phone that I like. I actually have like a lot of like emo yeah. songs on my, my phone mostly. But I have this wow. one playlist where I specifically uh, have tagged songs as upbeat because one of the most important things is to not let these things go. When positive things happen, especially in the midst of a lot of suffering, in the midst of a lot of challenges, when positive things happen, you need to stay with those positive emotions and savor it like you would savor a delicious meal Mm. with every bite. Um, Because the more you savor it, the more robust memories are laid down in your mind about those events. The more robust memories are laid down about your role in it and how valuable these, these moments are. And they're a cushion against the negative things. Jonathan, I, I wanted to just dig on that because there's a there's an aspect of this that I go. So it's not necessarily just upbeat music. It, it's it's music that is associated with you being in a good time. So the music yeah. itself might not be upbeat pop mm-hmm. kind of thing, but it is takes you to a place that reminds you of mm-hmm. a wonderful experience that takes you back into that moment. Is that, I'm not getting right. that wrong, it, it, am it, I? It could both take you back to the moment if it's happened already, or it could help you as the moment is unfolding, savor the experience. Oh, It's yeah. like a boost. 
Wow. It, it's it's interesting. So my my daughter, um, her school does, uh, she's in junior high, and every, the first two weeks of junior high, they go on what they call an odyssey trip. It is a big two-week, 15-day trip in a bus. They camp for the first five days. They get to a location. They do some fantastic learning in different pieces, and then they, you know, ride a bus back and camp and do all this stuff. A fantastic piece, but every night they have singing around the campfire. and. It's funny because my daughter made a playlist of those. Songs. I mean, they don't play the music. They, they have a, you know, that one of the teacher plays guitars and they all sing these songs. And the other day she had a, a Willie Nelson song on her playlist. And I'm going, <laughs> what are you listening to Willie Nelson for? And it was because it was part of one of the songs mm-hmm. that she did. And so she's mm. re-listening, reliving those yeah. moments. And I, I love that aspect of savoring because to that point, I think that is exactly this element where she's reliving that, but it is bringing back those positive memories and really reinforcing that good component of of what was going on there yeah absolutely and and can i just say that if the playlist with happy music does not include earth wind and fires september it should i'm just i'm just just gonna i'm just gonna go on the record because it just it just has to i'm sorry Uh, but let's let's imagine for a minute john that you are uh stranded on a desert island for a year and you can bring two musical artists catalogs with you, everything that they've created. Which two musical artists do you think you'd want to have with you? Ooh, tough question. I, I think the two that come to mind the most, because I, I listen to them the most, are Elton John and Paul Simon. Oh, fantastic catalogs for both of them. I'm just going to give you props for that and uh, great songwriters and performers. And I think the reason I pick those is that they, as we just said about like positive things, they, their music spans the whole range of human emotion. I think a good songwriter has a catalog that spans the whole range of human emotions. Oh yeah. I, I like that actually. It, we, we asked this question of a fair number of guests and oftentimes they'll pick like complete opposites, you mm-hmm. know, Bach and Miles Davis or something, you know, so it's on really opposite ends, but I think you're right. I really agree with your logic that by choosing someone like Paul Simon or, or Elton John, the breadth of their of their catalog is huge. They've written about all the sad stuff. They've written about all the happy stuff. They've written about the breakups and the loves and and the challenges and overcoming them. Uh, I, I, I'm with you on that. Jonathan, I, and you may not have an answer for this or research around this, but uh, as you started saying that, it, it clicked this idea in my head, which is around resilience. And we, you, you talk about bringing in some of those positive music and mm-hmm. upbeat and different things. People love the sad song. They, they, they going into that emotion of, you know, a heartbreak, um, you know, some sort of negative crying almost, you know, as people feel that. Is there anything or can you think of an aspect of the sad? aspect of that sharing of this, that I'm not the only one going through this emotion of listening to that breakup song that can help in being more resilient. Is there any research that you know of, or does that, am I way off base on, on where my head is going there? Yeah, there, I mean, there's plenty of research on the psychology of music, but what I would say is, right, any, you know, all of these songs from artists, they have a, like, they have a fan base, there's concerts, people have a shared emotional experience around a piece of music. And I, like I, I mentioned, I have emo songs, and I have songs that I know make me cry. Yeah. And what I you know, I had, you know, a couple of really challenging days recently uh, with work stuff, and I listened to those songs yeah. on the way home. And it yeah. helped me actually work through some of the emotions and help me make sense of them. And one of the things that I really convey in the book is that, you know, emotions like anxiety, fear, sadness, where they're called negative emotions as if they should be and could be erased from the human experience. They are part of the human experience. They're basic human emotions. We have to, and, but, and they're signals from our body. They're signals from our brain. We can choose what to do with them, what to do with that information, but we can't erase it. 
at least our neurosurgery isn't good enough to like go into the brain and carve out. <laughs> and, and, and it gives it gives texture to life. At the same time, it can be overwhelming, right? It can turn into an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder like major depression. But the emotion in and of itself is not a bad thing, is not dangerous. There's no good or bad emotions. And we should have probably talked about this earlier because I know we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, but in that component of that, right? And you talk about framing in the book. So is there an element of looking at how our body is responding to a situation and then uh, can we can we reframe that? Can we can we take us uh, an experience that we have and look at it differently? You talked about this a little bit too, of just that example of uh, the mugging thing. And if I was alone, I kind of you know worry that I, oh I caused this, but you have that outside person helping reframe. But is there a way? Is that a positive element that we can do ourselves to try to reframe to again build up some of this resilience or to change how we respond to that stress level? Absolutely right. And you know that's what I do with my patients. I see patients and I do cognitive therapy, and that that's the bread and butter of cognitive therapy: reframing how we see situations. Let me just give you an example. Uh, so prior to the pandemic, one of the most common fears was public speaking. Mm. When people are afraid of public speaking, the mere thought of speaking in front of a crowd kicks off a stress response in the body that is on par with having a bear chase after you. <laughs> like, I, I'm not yeah, kidding. I, I, mean, I know uh, it's, it's yeah. crazy, but yes, that, that's, oh man. And because of that, well, first off, there isn't an actual life threat. There is an imagined threat right. that is causing a reaction on par with an actual life threat. So that's an important distinction that people should be aware of. Your body's reacting as if it is under a threat. It is not. It's a thought that's causing that reaction and a imagined worst case scenario. And what do we do for fear of public speaking? Well, we break it up into little pieces and we help people tolerate those that, that feeling of anxiety and learn that A, the feeling's not gonna kill them, they can learn from that feeling and they can gradually you know, learn strategies to manage the anxiety and practice little bits of public speaking. And by the time they get to the big event of speaking in front of a crowd, they'll have a little bit of anxiety, but they won't be so overwhelmed with fear, worry about the worry or like the urge to run out of the room because they've built up practice and some regulatory strategies. They've leaned into the fear rather than ran away from the fear. People are afraid of public speaking. They don't do it. Yeah. People are afraid of flying in airplanes. They don't do it. And by not doing it, they never get the feedback that it doesn't kill them. Hmm. Right. People are afraid of flying on an airplane because they think it's going to crash. The solution is flying on an airplane and it not crashing. <laughs> we have good base I, I'm, rates I'm on being that. blind yeah. because they're out of time. But that's, <laughs> yeah. that's really the, the having these experiences corrects the misinterpretation. I've sat next to somebody on the plane who it was that <laughs> they were doing that work because they were very fearful and had a few drinks in order to help them overcome <laughs> that fear. But they they survived. We landed. We were perfectly good. And hopefully uh, that went forward. But Jonathan, thank you. Thank you so much for being a guest on Behavioral Grooves. It was a fascinating conversation. And uh, I know all our listeners go out and buy this book. It's a fantastic book and it gets into even much more detail than what we were able to cover here. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Jonathan, have a free flowing conversation and groove on whatever else comes into our grateful and resilient brains. What a nice pairing. Yeah. What a lovely pairing, well, actually. It's one of those pieces that I took from this conversation, this idea of how important gratitude is in the entirety of this resilience kind of element, that it's not just about feeling good. It, it actually is a good tool to use when you're not feeling good. Yeah, as if we needed more evidence that gratitude is a good thing to have in your life. This is this is more of it. I am so grateful that you said that, Tim, you know. <laughs> okay, Captain Gratitude or Dr. Gratitude, <laughs> probably as you'd like to be known. I want I um, just all right, you said that and I just envisioned this like me in a cape with a big, you know, G on the thing, you know, the bald bearded 
cape guy <laughs> with gratitude <laughs> flying up in the air. Flow. Well, why not have like this big mane on top of your head, you know, flowing? And you know. Oh, so you're saying that I should be like ungrateful that I'm bald well, and that I should no. that because it's a, a fictional <laughs> character I can now put long flowing hair on? Ah, thanks, Tim. Now you just made me self-conscious. When was the last time you saw a superhero with long hair? That's that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you could be different. <laughs> when was the last time you saw? Well, I guess there are bald superheroes. Okay. All right. All right. So let's forget okay. about us here. Yes, and superheroes. Our gratitude superheroes. What did you take from this conversation, Mr. Houlihan? Well, let's start with how Jonathan does a great job of shifting the conversation from overcoming to focusing on dealing with oh. like like this idea that it's not just about like okay you know i'm i'm kicked down and i'm you know i'm i'm things are bad and blah 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 it's like he's just like recognize that yeah. accept that be authentic and then figure out well okay so what do i need to do i think there's something kind of practical and pragmatic about that that i really like this is a really key concept for me, this idea that resilience isn't about overcoming all the stress and anxiety in your life so that you're stress and anxiety free. Right. right. It is this idea that you can now cope, you can deal with, you have the tools and the ability and the mindset to be able to say, yeah, I have stress in my life. I have anxiety. Mm -hmm. I have those things. And to a certain degree, it's like, that's okay. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to move forward. And that's the resilience. It's the getting knocked down and get up again. Right. What was that? Yeah. What was that music song from that British, you know, and I get down yeah. and I get up again. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't remember who that was right now terribly, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, it comes or it reminds me of something that came from Gestalt therapy, like in the sixties and seventies with Fritz Perls and this whole idea of, naming something helps take some of the wind out of it. Yes. Right. And, and there's something valuable about acknowledging I am suffering right now or I'm struggling right now. Well, and, and being, that's okay. Yeah. And being concrete in those descriptions. That's one of the things that I've learned about this from other, other researchers, that idea of the naming kind of gives itself some weight, but it's like, why would I want to name the negative emotions that I'm feeling? Well, if you do that, it takes some of that fear, some of the negative aspects of it away. And the more concrete you can get with that labeling, in other words, are you feeling anxious or I'm feeling you know, kind of trepid and, uh, you know, a little uh, awkward in this situation because I'm not yeah. quite sure. Like the more detail that you can add into that, I think it's all better for that. That's really cool. I would also say that it's not, I'm not a big fan of framing difficulties in your life. Like I'm thinking specifically, and this might be a bit of a tangent, but I just have to rant when I hear people say, he's battling cancer or he lost his battle with cancer and passed away. Like, oh man, like, I don't want to do battle with cancer. I don't want to battle. It's a disease, right? I, I'm not outfitted to battle cancer. What, what I want is the medical community to give me the best recommendations on what I should do in my personal life. And I want them to give me medication or treatment or something. I don't want to do, I don't want to do battle. And I feel like that's, I'm, is, I'm sorry. That's a bit of a rant. So, but. all right. I might disagree with you here. Isn't that a battle regardless? So having the mindset, the mind frame of coming into this as cancer could get me down. Cancer could, it could just be this, yes. uh, you know, diagnosis that I get where, damn it, I got cancer and now I just have to depend on others to take and make sure that I'm well. Whereas yeah. opposed to I have cancer, but damn it, I'm going to freaking battle that. And I am, I'm not going to let cancer take over my life. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that I kick cancer's freaking ass. <laughs> right. I disagree. No, yeah, no, I, th no. I, th I think I do. You're and wrong, by the way, but that's okay. <laughs> as, well, that happens all the time. So that's not new. Yeah, I just I, I think it's interesting. I, I think that there is a, absolutely a mindset component to it. 
but but we'll have to I, I don't have cancer so I'm not facing a life-threatening disease yeah. you know so uh, so I don't know what what did you take away from this Kurt what what do you want to groove on I, I, I think there's an aspect where resilience itself involves growth when you are resilient in other words you're probably growing yeah. you are learning new things about yourself it's this I'll do a bad analogy. It's it's the weightlifting, right? So the if I'm start off, right, my resilience may be low. And so I only have I can only lift 50 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I'm I'm able to I go to the gym and I work out more and all of a sudden I can I can lift 75 pounds. I can lift a hundred pounds. Right. And I think I think there's an aspect of resilience that is I could handle so much stress and anxiety. I could handle so much of this. And then I was resilient and I did it and I was able to accomplish that. And so I know that I can accomplish that. And next time I'm actually able, I can take on a little bit more and different pieces. And so there's an aspect of growth and that could sound negative. It could sound like, well, you're just ramping up the levels of stress and anxiety in your life. And why would you want to do that? And I'm not, not saying that, but what I'm saying is that I think we grow not only in our ability to cope and to stand and get back up, as they say, you know, get knocked down, back on your feet again. But we also grow in understanding of what the world is throwing at us and how we handle it and the internal aspects of that. I don't know. Long rant. No, that that's really great. I would also add that really finding your groove in part is sort of the problem solving of being resilient. Right. Nah. Like if you're going to if you're going to live a happy and productive life, you kind of have to figure out how to problem solve your way through challenging times. And I think resilience is a key part of that. So I would just say that find that if, you know, living a good, healthy, happy and productive life in part comes from connecting to your own resilience. I think you're right. I think that's absolutely right. I also think that this doesn't mean that you always have to be positive about things that happen, mm -hmm. right? This growth right. isn't always being Pollyanna. Oh, well, I grew so much from that. I have this great kind of thing. But it it does mean that you need to accept those things. You have to be authentic and realistic and not gloss over those negative right. aspects. And mm -hmm. it's, there's a bit about this that is kind of stoic, right? This idea that... Yeah. Yeah. The world is what the world is, and I can control only so many things within that world. So let me focus on those things that I can control and let everything else be realistic about it. Don't don't, you know, put blinders on your eyes or wear rose colored glasses at all those points. But let's really focus in on. All right. What do I need to do and set up a plan for solving the solution as best you can. You beautifully articulated my argument for not doing battle with cancer. But you are. But you're, you're putting the plan <laughs> together to battle. This is what I'm doing. I Oh, my God. Let, but that actually, that's, it's okay. Let's, uh, we're not going to go back into that. But let's skip on to, let's talk about some of the, the 10 sort of tenets that, that Jonathan wrote in, and his co-authors wrote in the book. Let, let, see, yeah, see, no. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling anxious that we're just skipping over this kind of it's, thing uh, that we have <laughs> and we should confront it and we need to go to battle about this. And then, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. All right. No, let's let's focus in on the 10 things because I think they're important. OK, you, you want to get started? So first he talks about in the book, he talks about confront their fears, this idea that you need to you, you can't be Pollyanna about this. You can't just put your head in, in the sand and forget about the anxiety and the negative aspects of your life, that you have to confront those fears that you have and the negative emotions that are around that. Yeah. Uh, number two is to maintain an optimistic but realistic outlook. And again, getting back to your stoic comment, this is uh, acknowledging what the world is actually doing to us or how we're interacting with the world and whatever suffering we're feeling, whatever pain acknowledge it and be optimistic that it's going to change but realistic right it's like yeah. it's not yeah. like i'm going to oh i'm tomorrow i'm going to be you know perfect and and everything else all right 3 and this one for me was 
really key. It's this I, the idea that he talks, Jonathan talks about, he said, seek, accept, and provide social support. Mm-hmm. I, I think oftentimes when we get in these situations and a lot of the research is we tend to t- all of a sudden turn inward, right? We, we look and we don't necessarily look outward for that social support. So we don't seek it and we don't accept it when somebody even tries. And oftentimes we don't provide it. And actually that provide part for me is really key. I think going out and being, and even with maybe you're not in a negative emotional state, but making sure that as you in your positive emotional state, make sure you're going out there and providing some social support for people. Because you'll feel better. Yeah. You'll, you'll actually feel better for it. Okay. Number four is imitate sturdy role models. Now, is that like, and I've um, had, you know, uh, people who are who stand up tall and you can lean on <laughs> like a Paul Bunyan sturdy is Paul, Paul Bunyan. Bunyan. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. Uh, you, you and I have had this conversation many times. I'm not a big fan of using people like uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, you know, as role models. Uh, I think their accomplishments are amazing, but they're one in a billion people. I would turn, and I think Jonathan supports this, in, uh, imitating sturdy role models is more about finding people in your life who have persevered through things that you might be going through. Yes. Talk, how did they get through? Right? L- learn, learn from people that you know more about their background and their context. Yeah. That's- I, I, I double down, triple down on that because I think the aspect of finding those people in your life that are going through, uh, they can help you with this, right? They can give you guidance. And with that, number five that Jonathan talks about is rely on your, on an inner moral compass. And I think that's important too, because even though you have those sturdy role models, that has to be true to you. And and yep. what you do, how you respond is based upon some deeper set moral compass that you have within you. Yeah. Number six is turn to religious or spiritual practices. And the operative word here is practice. I think that the idea is look to ways that you have in your life access to to whatever it is that provides you with, with healing and rely on those practices. Yeah. Rely on the things that you can do. Yeah. And resilient people, as he says in number seven, attend to their health and well-being. You it's a key aspect is our bodies and how well, well we're feeling have a great deal of input into our emotional resilience. So the be yeah. attendant to that. So make sure you're doing all the right things and you know what those are. Number eight is remain curious, pushing yourself to learn new things. Oh, this is like our ethos. It comes easy for for you and me, and it doesn't come easy for everybody. But curiosity and pushing yourself to learn new things is a great way of expanding the vocabulary that you have in your life to describe and define and work through issues. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Nine, resilient people approach problems with flexibility. And this, I think, is key. At times, acceptance. Again, this idea that we have to face our problems. And you know what? I had a plan. This was, I was going to do this and I was going to go all mm-hmm. this. And well, maybe, maybe that plan needs to change. Maybe you need to not be the CEO of the company and you need to, that's okay. Be flexible. Mm-hmm. It goes back to a lot of what we talk about. Right? So we're, you know, finding that groove. What is your groove? And you can be flexible with that. And I think that's really important. The last one, number 10, is to find meaning and growth during and after your traumatic experience. No. Oh. Which is so reflect, be reflective. Think of it, it's hard to reflect when you're in the midst of, of struggle, but afterwards, and, and I feel like I always think about the wave metaphor as things come in waves, knowledge comes in waves, our experiences come in waves. So take time to revisit the shore where there's a new wave coming in mm. on insight and uh, self-reflection. Yeah. There's uh, some, don't just do it once. There's some really, you know, there's this idea of, of post-traumatic stress disorder. And then there's some really cool work on post-traumatic growth where this yeah, idea that, yeah. you know, people go through the exact same situation, some of them, 
end up kind of being debilitated. And some of them actually grow from that experience, that traumatic experience. And so as much as you can, and I, and, and not playing blame on anybody that has negative, you know, a P, PTSD or any of those aspects, that's, it's hard, it's tough. And that's, a, it's a real uh, component, but understand that a traumatic experience in and of itself doesn't necessarily mandate that you will then have PTSD, that you can actually grow from those situations, even horrific situations. And as a result of that, you can know who you are better. You can grow from it. You can, you can find purpose in life. You can do a whole bunch of things that uh, maybe not have come from there. So, yeah. Well said. Well said, Kurt. All right. So is that about enough to wrap this up, you think? I think so. Right. I think we could wrap this up. Well, yeah. then let's wrap up this grooming session. And before we get to a special announcement, Ooh, special I want to express my gratitude because gratitude is important, as we know, right? Who are still uh, hanging on and listening to us after more than how many episodes, Tim? How many? I don't know. 380 something. 380 like three. episodes. How grateful oh could God. we be to be able to do this for Oh, it's 2024 now. So that's seven years. That's a lot of gratitude we've got for <laughs> to, to <laughs> offer that one up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so thanks for joining us. Okay. Um, back to the announcement. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We want to give you, our listeners, a heads up that in just a few weeks, we will be releasing a five-part series on the history of behavioral economics called Drum roll, please. They thought we were ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I said that horribly. But this is a three-year endeavor that you and I have been on, and it will be coming out in February of 2024. Oh, man, I'm really glad that you brought this up, Kurt, because this is a very exciting side project for us because it's the first time in history that behavioral economics will be memorialized in a podcast. And we're super excited about being the ones to actually bring that forward. Memorialized. <laughs> exactly. your podcast. There you go. <laughs> and just to let you know, it will not be a boring history lesson. It's not just boring facts and figures and dates and battles. Mm -hmm. mm. battle about this right <laughs> uh and the number of casualties and all that stuff no no it's yeah more. okay yeah it's uh it's not it's behavioral science it's not the history of the second world war so <laughs> <laughs> just want to let listeners know that this is a fun and engaging story and a story is i think really good and we partnered with somebody who's even better at telling stories than Tim and I are, Andy Luttrell, uh, who uh, heads up the Opinion Science podcast. Which, if you have not checked out Opinion Science, you should check it out right away. Yes, yes, yes. And what we've created is something that will be entertaining and informative. At least we think so. We've interviewed Nobel laureates who were the foundations of behavioral science. It's crazy to think that behavioral science is a field of study that we almost take for granted these days. Because at one point, the founders were almost shunned from the traditional economics community and, and they were ignored in, you know, the psychology side of things. So there you go. Yeah, this is a very cool story. And these five episodes cover a lot of ground. The series also delivers some pretty cool insights into what happened to change the face of neoclassical economics and how a bunch of rebel researchers found ways of creating a field within a field. Mm -hmm. we, we will share some research also that isn't always talked about, but has really been seminal in the field. So I think there's going to be a bunch of new insights. Yeah. The series also highlights what's happening next, where the field is headed, and how it has the potential to impact more change in our world. In other words, it's going to, you know what? It's not stopping here. It's not done. It We're, is going to there, keep going. There is more ahead with behavioral economics, isn't yes, there? Yes, there is. Yes. Well, it's it's going to be great. And we'll keep you posted on that February launch. Um, but in the meantime, we hope that our discussion with Jonathan DePiro and his work on resilience will help you this week as you go out and find your groove. 